Hello again, and welcome back to the Geodynamics Lectures on Measuring Stress and Strain. Here in the second lecture on this topic, we're going to talk about how stress is measured. We have two goals in this lecture. First, I'm going to introduce a couple methods for measuring stress. And in addition to that, we're going to make the distinction between stress measurements of rock strength versus in situ or in place measurements of stress in the crust. And these two things um, provide us with different information about the Earth. When we measure stress, we can do it basically in two ways. First, uh, there are rock yield stress or strength measurements that are often performed in a laboratory. And these measurements provide us information about the strength of rock or the amount of stress that rock can support prior to failure or fracturing. An alternative that provides different information is to measure stress in place in the lithosphere. So in situ, meaning that we drill a hole somewhere into the crust and measure stress in place or uh, use other methods to do something similar. The focus in these kind of measurements is actually to look at the stress field in the surrounding lithosphere around the sample site rather than the strength of the rock itself at the sample site. So for the lab laboratory measurements, a uh, common setup for this type of measurement is shown here on the left side in this picture. You can see here a cylinder of rock and it's sitting between two sides of a press that can be used to basically squeeze vertically down on this rock cylinder and crush it. And so you can measure very well with the equipment then how much stress is needed to be applied to this rock sample before it fails. So this is an example of a direct stress measurement and you can see some observational data that could be collected for this kind of measurement where we're showing on the vertical axis of this plot the differential stress. Um, this would be the difference between sigma 1 and sigma 3 so you can think of that as a measure of how hard you're squeezing and then along the horizontal axis is the strain. And so initially, you can see an increase in both the strain and the differential stress, and that's when you're in the elastic um, part of the deformation of this rock sample, and you're simply just slowly squeezing it down prior to failure. The red star here indicates the point at which the rock's yield strength is reached, and the rock then fractures. And what happens after that is a function of the type of rock and its properties, where it may become still a bit more difficult to deform or uh, perfectly plastic where the differential stress does not have to be increased for further deformation or may even weaken slightly. So this is a transition then between the elastic and uh, brittle or plastic deformation field. Okay, so that's measuring rock strength in the laboratory. In situ measurements of stress are again telling us something different. These are telling us about the stress in the lithosphere where the observation is made. Now the first type of measurement that we can talk about is called overcoring. And an example of what overcoring looks like is shown in the figure here on the left side. You can see here a very cartoon-like um, picture of a hole that's drilled into rock. So you can see here if we were looking at cross-sectional view the hole that's been drilled and this would be looking down the hole from above. In the bottom of this hole have been um, some strain gauges that have been inserted, and so these are going to measure deformation and what happens in the second part of this procedure. So first we drill the hole and we put in the strain gauges. After that, you drill an outer annular hole or a hole that goes around the outside of the original hole and basically isolates that original hole from the surrounding rock. And when you do that, the relaxation that takes place is giving you an indication of the stresses that were there prior to drilling this outer hole. So what's going to be recorded then in the strain gauges is a representation of the relaxation of the stress field within the inner hole. And so this is a potentially useful method. However, you have to note that the sort of biggest size hole that it works with is about a meter. So this is something that needs to be drilled uh, either at the surface or somewhere within a mine or some kind of environment like that. It's obviously not some measurement that can be taken deep 
in the crust very easily. Okay, so that's overcoring. An additional method for measuring in situ stresses, that's a common, um, common approach, is called hydrofracturing, and you've probably already heard of hydrofracturing in the oil and gas industry and perhaps some of the controversy surrounding that, and we'll get to that in just a slide or two. But just to tell you how this works, um, particularly in the case of measuring stresses in situ, hydrofracturing basically involves isolating a part of a drilled hole and then pumping in fluids to measure the strength of the rock surrounding this isolated section of a hole. So in order to do that, you use a setup that looks something kind of like this. Uh, obviously, this is in cartoon form, but you have these things called packers that allow you to basically seal off the section that you're interested, the test interval between the two packers. So this isolates them from downhole or up or uphole. You have uh, drilling equipment and you've got a flow meter here and some pumps and things like that that allow you to pump fluids down into this test interval. So you pump in some fluid to the isolated segment and you keep a measurement of the pressure with your data recorder here shown just as a little computer. So continually measuring pressure. The pressure of the fluid is going to be increased and increased until fracturing occurs. At the point of fracture, the pressure uh, that you note at that point is what's called the breakdown pressure. This is the point where the rock fails um, and the, the, the pressure exceeds the rock strength. And so that's indicated often as PB, breakdown pressure, or pressure with the B indicating breakdown. And if the pump is switched off immediately after that, uh, and you don't allow the fluid to uh, circulate freely, uh, you'll attain what's called the instantaneous shut-in pressure, and that's, uh, that's what will be recorded. It'll make more sense what that means on the, uh, the next slide here. All right, so here, now we've got a plot of a sort of cartoon version of one of these hydrofracturing measurements. Here on the top showing pressure in megapascals and then time along the horizontal axis. Uh, so in this case, you could see here's the initial stage where you're just pumping in water to your isolated part of your hole, continually increasing the pressure until you hit that breakdown pressure where uh, the rock then fails in that segment. And you can see immediately that the pressure drops significantly down to this lower sort of plateau value here. That's what that instantaneous shut-in pressure value is. That's the minimum pressure that's required to keep the fractures around the rock open. So you need to have at least that much fluid pressure in order to have the fractures open. And if we make a couple assumptions like vertical fracture orientations and that the fractures have formed in pure tension, we can then take that uh, instantaneous uh, shut-in pressure value as being equal to the minimum horizontal, horizontal principal stress. So that's a useful thing, obviously. Uh, another thing you can note here is if you were to then repressure your hole, if you let the fluid out and then pump it back in, you're only going to get up to your instantaneous shut-in pressure because, again, once you pump your fluid in on the rock, fractures open up, the fluid simply flows into the fractures. You can also, from PB and the uh, instantaneous shut-in pressure, you can get an estimate of the maximum horizontal principal stress, but that's something that is a bit less accurate. So regarding this fracturing or hydrofracturing um, topic, of course, there's been a bit of controversy about this. Um, maybe a bit more in the U.S. than uh, in, in Europe, or at least this part of Europe. But in the U.S. where there's a lot of oil and gas and uh, natural gas exploration that's uh, going on currently, particularly in rocks that are not particularly porous, uh, fracturing or hydrofracking has been used uh, widely. And the method essentially is that you're just drilling your well and going down into some layer of rock that's not particularly porous such as shale, and then pumping in fluid to get the rock to fracture, which then allows the gas and um, oil or whatever you're after to flow into the fractures, and it's much more easily extracted at that point, of course. So you can see here these fissures or fractures that have formed around this hole, and then if you were to extract the fluid out of the, um, the drill hole there, you would presumably have a better connectivity of fluid within there, which makes the oil or gas extraction easier. So it's basically the same concept that we use making these in situ stress measurements. The issue has been in some cases concerns about what happens when you fracture this rock, whether 
Um, some of these potentially dangerous fluids have been leaking into groundwater or things like that. And um, there's still, uh, I think, active arguments about the relative safety of hydrofracturing versus other oil and gas exploration methods. Um, it doesn't seem to be a great deal of evidence of things like um, leaking of the fracking, fracking fluid from the zone of fracture into the uh, groundwater, but there are potentially other ways that groundwater could potentially be contaminated. All right, so that was our quick tour of a few different stress measurement methods. And again, if you're taking the quiz on Moodle, now is your chance to see what you've learned. And we'll come back and see you in the next lecture.